So, dann beginnen wir mit der Abschlussveranstaltung bzw. mit dem Abschlussvortrag. Der Vortrag ist ein bisschen länger gestaltet als ähm, die Vorträge, die wir bisher gehört haben, da als Abschlussvortrag nochmal ein kurzes Resümee ziehen soll. Ich stelle ihn trotzdem, auch wenn er nicht hier ist, in Abwesenheit kurz einmal vor. Christopher Thornell ist Professor an der Universität Manchester und war Dekan der Law School von 2018 bis 2019. Davor war er an der University of Glasgow, am King's College an der, und der University of Sussex tätig. Er begleitete verschiedene Gastprofessuren, zu denen die McKenzie University in Sao Paulo oder die Universität Bielefeld gehören. Er ist unter anderem Humboldt-Preisträger, Mitglied der Academia Europea und erhielt den World Complexity Science Academy Award for Lifetime Achievements. Seine Forschungsschwerpunkte sind Rechtssoziologie, Sozialtheorie und Rechtsgeschichte. Er ist führender Vertreter der Verfassungssoziologie bzw. auch Konstitutionalismus. Seine letzten Publikationen tragen den Titel The Sociology of Law and the Global Transformation of Democracy und ein weiterer Titel A Sociology of Transnational Constitutions, Social Foundations of the Post-National Legal Structure. Bereits diese Titel zeigen das starke rechtssoziologische Interesse und dessen Verknüpfung mit einer historischen Betrachtung. Gerade das hat uns dazu gebracht, Chris Thornhill heute eben als Abschlussvortragenden auszuwählen. First of all, I'd, um, I'd like to say thank you very much to the organizers of the um, of this conference for inviting me to give a lecture. It's a great honor for me to speak at, at this event, such an important occasion. I must say, it's the first time that I, I've ever spoken at a, uh, a conference on military history. And uh, it's the first time that I've ever given a lecture in my own kitchen which is what I'm doing now, so two uh, slightly new experiences for me. Uh, but uh, my, my warmest thanks to the, to the organizers and of course to all participants. I'm very sorry that I can't be there in person to engage in discussion. Uh, I was asked to, to give a presentation on the sociology of law and its connections with military history, perhaps also with military sociology. So I, I've written quite a, a broad, broad ranging paper on ways in which the sociology of law can contribute to analysis of military processes and, and analysis of military tensions and conflicts between states. Now this may seem like a somewhat unusual undertaking in that it's usually observed that sociology as a whole as a blind spot with regard to war, that all, although sociology seeks to reconstruct the formation of modern society, uh, it, it's only marginally concerned with military factors. And this, of course, applies doubly with particular emphasis to the case of the sociology of law. And that the sociology of law, like sociology more generally, is designed to interpret explain the logics of modern society, but it does so by assessing, usually by assessing processes of law, legal norm construction in which war plays only a peripheral role. We can say that broadly, the sociology of law is divided into two different fields. It's divided into a pluralistic field, which focuses on the, the pluralistic residues of law outside patterns of formal institution building and formal legal construction. There's also the more integrationist line in the sociology of law, which developed during the, the period of, of classical sociology. And this second line is strongly focused on explaining social formation as the outcome of um, patterns of social integration in which individual persons are detached by law from embedded identities or collectivities in society. So individualization and integration form the primary units of analysis in this more dominant line in the sociology of law. But generally, these two different camps in the sociology of law have very little time 
it for considering military factors. And indeed, the dominant focus of legal sociological research in both lines appears to be placed on intra-societal processes of integration in particular, so that the focus on the interstate level, which is naturally vital for comprehending military occurrences, is outside the view of legal sociology. However, I'd like to make the claim in this paper, this presentation, that in a slightly implicit way, the sociology of law is a very is a vital science for addressing the impact of military factors in modern society and the formation of modern societies, and that different lines in the sociology of law are actually perhaps somewhat unintentionally concerned with military processes, or they at least throw light on the way in which warfare and military mobilization has, has shaped modern social form. And to make these claims, to set out this argument, I'd like to make two claims. Firstly, taking the, the integrationist paradigm from classical sociology, I'd like to advance the claim that if law is a medium of individual integration in society, we cannot understand the integrational function of law without considering how imperatives of a military nature shape this functionality. And that, as I'll try to explain as we go on, law's integrational force is primarily determined by war or by the threat of war. And periods of actual warfare have usually been periods of accelerated social integration through law. From this perspective, then, I add the subsidiary claim that legal sociology, rather than being focused on social facts within national societies, is strongly qualified to illuminate the interactions between processes at the national level and processes at the interstate level. The, uh, the, if we take legal integration as a unit of analysis, this cannot be restricted to intra-societal processes of integration. Rather, it, um, it's focused on links between interstate processes and intra-societal processes. A second claim then, somewhat more tentative, is that if we take the integrationist framework, the sociology of law also allows us to explain the preconditions for war, or at least to identify social conjunctures in which war may be likely to occur. And the one argument I want to set out is that warfare, interstate conflict, is partly determined by integrational failures at the national level within national society. So that when failures of this kind occur, there's an increased propensity amongst states for, uh, for military conflict. And this, is, this can be identified through legal sociological methods. So legal sociological methods can actually help analyze points of crisis in the, in the world system or the interstate system. Now, I'm gonna to start to explain these points by setting out a a two-pronged reconstruction of the interaction between warfare and legal integration in national societies. And in both lines, we're focusing on constitutional law. And the constitutional law is the primary sphere of law which uh, covers, controls, determines uh, patterns of, uh, of, uh, of integration within within national societies and national polities. And the impact of war on law more generally is manifest above all in the development of constitutional law. And we can see this at a normative level. And that essentially, national constitutions are based in two legal norms, both of which promote the integration of citizens in society. Const constitutions are based in the norm of constituent power. They bring legitimacy to government by expressing the norm of constituent power. And they bring legitimacy to government by setting out the principle that persons subject to political authority must be recognized as holders of certain subjective protections, usually known as rights. And these rights fall into three subsets procedural rights, political rights, and social rights. Now, 
my claim about constitutions is that constitutions shouldn't, shouldn't be understood purely as the outcomes of rational or collective agreements between citizens. This is how constitutions are usually normatively reconstructed. But really, constitutional uh, law has a, a, can be interpreted from a functional perspective. Constitutional law performs primary functions for society. And these functions are focused on social integration, the integration of citizens. In the, by setting out these two norms, constituent power and basic rights, constitutions promoted the emergence, the evolution of national political systems that were able to reach across society to draw people in different social domains or different regional domains into the purview, into the institutional structure of the state. And by setting out these norms, national states um, created incentives for citizens to accept governmental organizations as leading centers of, of political authority and social integration. In other words, national state institutions essentially acquired the attribute, the quality that we now describe as sovereignty by constructing constitutions based in these two separate norms. Most importantly, constitutions or these normative constructions underlying modern constitutions had the result that modern states were able to use an idea, were able to explain their legitimacy in terms that were completely endogenous. And that these constructs created an idea of legitimacy within the state, which was independent of other organizations, either national or international, and which allowed the national state to explain and justify its functions without external normative support. This endogenous construction of legitimacy dramatically extended the force of national political systems within their own societies. Indeed, we could say that this constitutional construction of legitimacy in endogenous terms is at the very core of modern national societies. This, this construction drove the, the processes of legal integration, which define nations. On this basis, I'd like to make two observations about the history of constitutionalism. Firstly, we can see that the normative um, impetus, the normative dynamic released by constitutional law only gradually acquired material results in the it took a long time for constitutions to penetrate deeply into national societies, it took a long time for constitutions or for national societies to acquire integrated form. So we can divide constitutional law, the formation of constitutions and the performance of the integrational process that is connected with constitutions into five different waves. One is the revolutionary wave broadly from 1776 to the 1820s, which included revolutionary constitutions in the USA and France. Um, the, the 1812 constitution in Spain and the early constitutions of revolutionary Latin America or post-revolutionary Latin America. The second wave was broadly the period 1848 to 1895, but most constitutions in, created in this period were concentrated in the period 1860 to 1875, which included some of the most important constitutions in global history. The constitution of the Kaiserreich, uh, the constitution of the um, uh, of, uh, of Italy after unification, which was carried over from Savoy Piemont, constitutional laws of the French Third Republic of 1875, and the constitution of Spain. Same time, this um, this period also included constitutions in Latin America, in Argentina in the 1850s, Colombia 1886, and. It was kind of bookended by the Brazilian Constitution of 1891. It's at this moment, in this period, that constitutional uh, law became a standard model for the organization of political systems. The third wave of constitution making began in the First World War, and many states emerging from imperial government acquired new constitutions around this time, usually um, 
shortly after 1918, there were a couple of exceptions to this. Um, Spain was a bit later. Um, at this time, the characteristic of this wave is that for the first time, constitutionalism and democracy began to converge structurally. In that constitutions had historically promoted uh, an orientation towards democracy, but they hadn't really created democratic political systems. The fourth wave of constitution making occurred after 1945, post authoritarian constitutions in, uh, in, 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 um, in, in some states, in, in Japan, in Italy, in the Federal Republic of Germany, new constitutions in France and Brazil, and of course. Uh, the, the beginning of post-colonial constitution making um, expressed in the Indian constitution and later constitutions in Africa in the 1960s. The fifth wave of constitution making then was concentrated in the late 1990s, uh, the late 1980s and early 1990s, sorry, although it can really be extended from the Spanish constitution of 1978 through to constitutions created after 2000. What becomes particularly important when we look at this, look at this constitutional history, reconstruct, if we reconstruct the development of constitutions as a series of waves, or what we might call clustered phenomena, we can see a point which is almost universally ignored in constitutional history. And this is quite simply that up until the 1980s, the number of constitutions that were not created as a result of warfare is very small. Um, indeed, the uh, constitutions were almost invariably created in situations in which um, societies were being restructured through pressures of war and in which leadership elites were required to respond to military imperatives in intensified form. Now, I don't have time to dwell on this now, but I would say that the, the connection between constitutional law and warfare is inscribed in the, the diction of constitutional law at a very fundamental level, and that the key normative concepts in constitutional law that is constituent power and basic rights both provided frameworks in which um, military actors acquired positions of influence within national governments and above all in which states imposed military patterns of integration on the societies in which they operated. Most importantly we can see this in the construction of basic rights in na national constitutions, in the, the, three, the three different types of basic rights contained in national constitutions, procedural rights, political rights, and social rights, all developed in conjunction with military pressures. This is, of course, seen most clearly in the case of political rights, in that in most contexts, access to electoral rights for citizens was expanded in times when military conscription was imposed. So there was a very, very direct correlation between, as it were, the, the constitutional formalization of political rights and the imposition of military obligations on national citizens. To such an extent that we could see the political component of most constitutions, at least in the 19th century, but really beyond in most contexts until the 1920s, as a, a, a political military bargain in which national governments essentially gave rights to citizens in order to compensate them for the provision of military violence or expressed in a different way, um, they gave them political rights in order to motivate them to provide military violence. So the, the correlation between constitutional law and military pressures is very deep from the outset. Um, and the the processes of integration that we associate with constitutional law, the fact that constitutions allowed state institutions to reach more deeply into society was almost invariably connected with military patterns of integration and in that citizens were incorporated within state structures primarily because state institutions were becoming increasingly reliant on 
the mobilization of society for military purposes. I don't think this only applies to the concept of political rights. I think we can apply this to every normative element of modern constitutional law, but it's most salient in the case of political rights. What we can also observe, though, if we, if we start from the position that constitutions developed as integrational systems, which promoted uh, legal integration in order to, to secure and to stabilize the means of military violence within society, what we can also see is that constitutions were not very successful in doing this. This is a somewhat controversial argument, but if we look at the history of constitutional law from the revolutionary period right up to the Second World War, we can see that most constitutions actually intensified um, violence within their own societies. And this induced both forms of lateral conflict between citizens and um, patterns of interstate conflict with other sovereign entities, which constantly undermined the integrational functions that they were supposed to perform. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm not physically present, so I can't go into details to exemplify this. But I would say, as a blanket point, that up until 1945, the common assumption amongst political scientists that democracies or democratizing polities are not very belligerent is simply not true. Uh, quite the, we, we can see quite the opposite, which is that states on a trajectory of constitutional formation um, tended to militarize the constituencies that they were in the process of incorporating. They militarized them both laterally, they tended to militarize antagonisms between different social groups. And separately from this, but also partly because of this, they tended to intensify um, uh, hostilities with other states. And I, as one interim conclusion, I would say here then simply that constitutional states were defined by a deep contradiction from the outset. They were instituted to perform processes of military integration through law, but typically they were not actually capable of creating legal systems with sufficient force to secure such integration. Instead of this, they tended to lead to diffuse conflicts within national societies. Um, and I would say that this was the enduring paradox of constitutional states right up until the post-1945 period. Now, if we look at these questions, we can also, this, this also throws some light upon the development of international law. I'm not going to go into this in, in great depth at this moment, but I'd like to make an overarching claim that constitutions were premised in endogenous constructions of legitimacy. And these endogenous constructions of legitimacy brought constitutional law from it, its first emergence into a very conflictual relationship with international law. The patterns of integration conducted through constitutional law we're always in a complex opposition to norms forming part of international law, at least modern international law, in that um, international law tended to promote ex exogenic constructs of legitimacy. And these exogenic constructions of legitimacy were primarily intended to manage the use of sovereign force by states and to place some limits on the violence, the military violence that states produced. So constitutional law was established through experiences of violence that profoundly challenged the norms of international law. And once established, once put in place, constitutions tended to create social orders that perpetuated and reproduced this challenge. And at every moment in the development of modern constitutional law, we can see this process reproduce itself. The, 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 the fact that constitutions developed um, by mobilizing forms of violence that international law at the same time sought to suppress. You can see this in the revolutionary period in the, in the 18th century, in the international law at this time was still residually determined by principles deriving from the treaties of 1648, 
above all, international law at this time promoted conceptions regarding military law in which um, instruments of war were to be used exclusively by holders of sovereign titles. They were not to be placed in private hands. So the armies had to be subject to clear vertical lines of command. Laws of war at this time drew a strict line between interstate warfare and civil war. This was, of course, usually more a norm than a fact, as many armies were recruited by informal means. But this was a strong focus of international, the international laws of war at this time. Constitutional law, by contrast, began to develop in environments in which the, the partition between interstate war and civil war was eroded. And once created, constitutions um, repeatedly generated forms of conflict in which sovereign control of military organizations was lost. This can, this can be seen at every stage in the revolutionary period. This, this, con this contradiction is then repeated after the, the end of the revolutionary period. The Congress of Vienna took shape as an international organization whose specific function was to mediate or to, 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 uh, to, to provide a framework in which interstate disputes likely to cause war could be mediated. And to do this, the Congress separated um, legal authority, separated legal sovereignty from national populations, arguing that interstate disputes could be best regulated or mediated um, if they were not connected with questions of national interest or, 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 or popular motivation or belonging. So many constituent members of the Congress of Vienna adopted an extremely anti-constitutional um, policy in which they tried to, uh, to in which they, they actually saw the, the suppression of constitutionalism or the suppression of democracy as a way to guarantee interstate peace. But this um, interstate system was, of course, uh, dissolved or came in under increasing challenge through the 19th century. And its death knell was heard most audibly during the wars of unification in Italy and Germany, which in some ways uh, formed spaces of military conflict, which evaded the definitions, the constructions of, of sovereignty and the mechanisms for the mitigation of interstate violence that had been put, place, put in place in the Congress of Vienna. Ultimately, this public, uh, the public order, the European public order created in 1815 was finally destroyed in World War I through the fragmentation of European empires. Um, and the, uh, the, the military environments of World War I saw the pro proliferation of multiple forms of violence in which uh, the conduct of military violence uh, could hardly be attached to actors reasonably claiming uh, sovereign title. And it was in this environment then that the constitutions, uh, the, 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 the great wave of constitution making after uh, 1918 was located. In, in, in most of Europe, the collapse of the continental empires around 1918 gave rise to a situation in which new national constitutions were designed, and these constitutions were constructed to capture the violent energies released during the war. And in many cases, armies assumed privileged roles in ushering in constitution-making procedures. The bottom, the bottom line, the, the underlying principle that I'm describing is that the, the wave of mass constitution-making at this time was very strongly connected to the collapse of an interstate system whose um, primary function was the mitigation of interstate conflict. So constitutions mobilized forms of violence that had been released through the collapse of the, um, the Congress, or the, 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 the European system of public law created originally in 1815. But 1918, or the period after 1918, or saw the emergence of a new international system, a new system of international law, which slightly redirected the emphasis of earlier systems in that the, the, the international system created at the end of World War I 
was intended in some ways to uh, create an integrational structure in which constitutional law and international law could coexist, in which states might claim legitimacy simultaneously through endogenous and exogenic norms in the, this system partly directed by Woodrow Wilson, um, specifically acknowledged national sovereignty as a, the basis of governmental legitimacy. But at the same time, this system promoted a very strong exogenic image of the legitimate state as, as one that was bound by international rules, especially in military matters. There's an attempt to balance the conflicting legitimational claims of constitutional law and international law at this time. But as we know, this balance was not very successful. And within a very short period of time, it became clear that the new constitutions created in Europe after 1918 committed national polities to trajectories of integration in which military units again played a dominant role. And in some cases, the, 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 the phenomenon that I've, I've described earlier reproduced itself in extremely intensified form in that many governments created constitutions in military circumstances but they were simply incapable of integrating or, or uh, assimilating the forms of military violence that they released as part of the process of their own formation. So up to the Second World War, we can observe a repeated tension between the integrational practices of states under constitutional law and the practices of states under international law. And constitutional law usually evolved where explanations of the sovereign of the sovereign authority of states were transferred from exogenic to endogenous constructions of legitimacy. Generally, this conflict with international law re-articulated re the perennial paradox of constitutionally ordered politics. Ordered polities, rather. Polities integrated their populations through military purposes, but they lost the monopoly of the means of military violence in so doing. Now I'd like to say briefly that this situation changed rather after 1945. Now after 1945, we can see the emergence of a new international system which shaped state behavior in a rather different way from earlier international systems. In the, at this time, at one level, the international system that coalesced around the UN reflected many principles that had been fundamental to earlier systems recognized national sovereignty as the pillar of the basic pillar of the world community it placed strong emphasis on the inviolability of borders it was also designed to limit wars of aggression to regulate interstate conflict and it created a judicial order designed to regulate disputes between states very much like um, the system after 1918 but in some ways, the international system that emerged after 1945 had outcomes that were rather different from what we'd seen earlier. In the, 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 the international system after 1945 promoted exogenic images of legitimacy, principles of legitimacy for national governments that filtered or penetrated in different ways into national societies, much more deeply into national societies than had been the case in earlier patterns of state building. So that uh, international norms became very closely inflected with, um, uh, with domestic constitutional processes at this time. Now, none of this became reality very quickly. And for many contemporary observers, these processes might not have been very tangible. But I think we can see an interaction between the international legal system and domestic constitutional systems at this time on three levels. And with three separate outcomes. In the, the interaction between these two legal systems tended to create a model of state legitimacy for national polities in which government, governmental acts were legitimated primarily 
through the fact that they were proportioned to individual people in society. So the individual model of human rights, which was established in international law, fed into national societies as a principle of legitimacy. This meant that governments were able to generate legitimacy on individual premises. And they detached legitimacy from very collective, volatile exchanges. Secondly, this period saw the establishment of a construct of state legitimacy, in which the original prerequisites of legitimacy were stabilized outside national society, so that states effectively borrowed legitimacy for some of their acts from the international domain. And this also tended to weaken intra-societal conflict as a source of legitimacy. So the forms, the, the crises of integration that national states had experienced in early histor earlier historical periods because of the legal constitutional processes in which they interacted with their citizens became weaker as uh, domestic legal systems became more closely articulated with international norms, particularly international human rights law. And thirdly, this period promoted a construction of legitimacy that intersected with wider sociological patterns of individualization in domestic context, most particularly the rise of, the rise of human rights law within domestic constitutions uh, coincided with the rise of welfare states, which tended to promote processes of individualization, which were simultaneously legitimated by and in turn reinforced the domestic impact of human rights law. So the point that I'm trying to make very broadly is that after 1945, there began to emerge a, a, an international system whose primary impact was not at the international level, but within um, domestic constitutional domains. And the, the most important effect or result of this international system was that it softened the in, integrational interactions between national governments and their citizens even leading to something like a demilitarization of democratic citizenship. At this point, in any case, we see two phenomena that had not been strongly articulated in world society prior to 1945. We see that the number of democracies began to increase, but the number of democracies that showed an intense proclivity to engage in warfare with other states decreased. Overall, the management of intra-societal violence was just as important to the post-1945 system as the management of interstate violence. In fact, the softening of antagonisms within, between groups in national societies proved vital, arguably, to the reduction of external conflict. Now, I'm just running slightly over time, so I'd like to conclude with um, a few points. I mean, the, I, I said at the beginning that we might use this legal sociological integrational matrix to examine tendencies in contemporary society, or at least to examine the conditions in which um, uh, the international society is likely to experience renewed militarization. And to identify this, or to, to isolate these tendencies, the framework that I'm proposing suggests that we need to look, to identify such tendencies, we need to look at the interaction between two planes of the international system. We need to look at integrational processes within national societies, and we need to look at interactions between uh, nation states at the same time. And my analysis would say that we, we, can, we can identify a propensity for renewed militarization at the interstate level when endogenous and exogenic constructions of legitimacy within national political systems are unsettled. And because the fusion of these two constructions of legitimacy is at the heart of the process of relative pacification and relative democratization that occurred in the longer wake, in the decades after 1945. But taking this perspective, we could say that the conditions for a remilitarization of the international system are now partly met, at least in some regions. And this can be seen in three primary 
features or three primary symptoms. First of all, we can see globally, and this is a recent phenomenon, but we can see globally a weakening of the purchase of international human rights law, not necessarily at the international level, but certainly in national legal systems. In many cases, human rights are losing purchase as a premise for national legislation. The politicians often gain legitimacy by capitalising on hostility to human rights law. Examples of the UK, the USA, Brazil, but there are many more. This affects the solidity of international legal communities that tend to promote democracy, but it acquires a special importance in processes of social integration at the national level, as many policies, because of the weakening of human rights law, transfer their interactions with citizens from convergent exogenic endogenous models of legitimation back to strongly politicized constructions of legitimacy. And in some cases, this transfer of government governmental legitimacy entails or induces a clear remilitarization of relations in society, i.e. it induces increased conflict between different social groups. USA, Brazil, Poland can be taken as examples. And this is often exacerbated by the fact that we see globally, or we have seen globally, a retrenchment of welfare provisions in recent decades, so that the sociological patterns of individualization that support constitutional law have also been weakened. Second, we see a tendency towards, or a possible precondition for renewed militarization in the fact that the increasing volatility of lateral interactions in some national societies is connected with the re-emergence of military organizations as actors that claim to embody a national constituent will. See, we see this particularly in Brazil at the moment, also in Venezuela and to some degree in Russia. And in such cases, citizenship is again strongly defined by uh, military processes and the classical military emphasis of citizenship, constitutional citizenship is revived. In some cases, of course, this means that uh, governments show an increased propensity to engage in actual military conflict as a means of creating motivations for citizens to recognize them as legitimate. So the legitimation axis is switched from human rights law extracted from the international domain to military conflicts, which are positioned in the international domain. Where states release their legitimation or structures from international human rights law, there's always a risk that they will focus legitimacy on more traditional techniques for mobilizing citizens, which are usually connected with war. Finally, we can also see um, a precondition for remilitarization in the fact that international law itself has become paradoxical. International human rights law in particular has become acquired certain paradoxical implications. As I mentioned before, human rights law originally entered national legal systems after 1945 in the longer way, decades after 1945, in very diffuse fashion, um, often through osmotic or informal lines of assimilation. But in recent years, human rights law has been more directly politicized at the international level, providing at times grounds for the intervention of some states in the uh, domestic affairs of other sovereign states, even support, supporting military-led regime change on grounds that are at least questionable. This military rearticulation of human rights may be necessary in, 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 in some circumstances, I'm not arguing against some kind of humanitarian right to protect. But one observable outcome of this politicization of human rights as a ground for uh, international intervention in sovereign states is that international communities, international security communities, acquire unsettling implications for states that don't belong to them. And one of future outcome, likely future outcome of this, which is already coming into view, is that states that are not strictly compliant with exogenic projections of legitimacy will reject all compliance with international norm setters, which is likely to increase greatly the possibility of international conflict. So 
one key to understanding national democracy and interstate peace is to adopt premises derived from the classical tradition of the sociology of law. If we take the, the, the model in the classical sociology of law, the um, national legal systems are systems of integration. We can use this model to explain many things in contemporary society. This does not provide a narrative history of successful functional balance, but it presents a prism for assessing and explaining the effects of war in society, showing that national integration processes and military conflicts are two parts of an interwoven trajectory of systemic formation. Additionally, this um, reconstruction of the classical paradigms of legal sociology can assume vital utility as a perspective to explain both the preconditions for successful social pacification and possibly for the end of pacification. Now, I've spoken slightly longer than I intended to, but thank you very much for, for listening to me. And uh, I, um, I'm easily contacted if anybody wishes to discuss any of these propositions. Thank you very much.